this is a, a very timely exhibition that takes a particular view of housing in Ireland and it was made over the course of, of three years. Um, I suppose the notion of home or in Ireland, in Irish culture, in Irish society is a very uh, emotionally loaded one. Um, and the, the phrase that Jerry has chosen as the title of this exhibition has quite a, it carries a particular weight, uh, home place, that, that phrase in Irish, in Irish culture and Irish society. And I think it goes back to the, the sense that we're often feeling, dis, we often feel dispossessed um, uh, as, a, as a nation, as a culture. Um, and the, the connection we have to home and to the idea of home uh, is, is all the stronger because of that. So uh, we're going to talk for about 40 minutes, Jerry and myself, and we're going to look at his, his background, his photographer, his previous projects, his influences. Uh, we're going to talk in depth, I hope, about the development of this particular project and uh, the, the many issues that it brings up. Uh, I thought to get started, Jerry, what I would do is ask you just to talk a bit about your background and to, and to introduce yourself. Okay, thanks, Darren. Um, hi, uh, everybody. I'm Jerry Blake. For those who don't know me, um, some of you do. I recognise some names, and some are, some I don't. So you're very welcome. Uh, yeah, I've been a photographer. I'll start from now or backwards. Been a photographer for the last ten or twelve years. Um, before that, I worked in IT for about good to thirty years. Uh, and I'd always got an interest in photography going back to the 80s, I'd say, uh, mm -hmm. when I got a, an SLR camera. And uh, I'd wanted for a long time to uh, pursue that, uh, that interest. Uh, so uh, around about 2009, 2010, I started working a bit less and um, I did a course in NCAD in photography and went on from there to do a master's in um, I'll see university with Paul C. Wright, Donovan Wiley and mm -hmm. other well-known photographers, which was a terrific course and really kind of set me on my way. Mm -hmm. I've done various projects over the years, which we'll probably talk about. They all, um, they have different themes, but they have overlapping themes as well. And this is my second uh, solo exhibition. The first one was into the sea a few years back in the Mermaid Art Centre in Bray and uh, this is home place mm -hmm. in uh, the Municipal Gallery in Dunleary which I'm delighted to have shown there. Yeah one of the things that came up when we were talking before uh, the conversation and about your work was that you have this very consistent interest in, in working with particular places often you go to a place and you keep going back to it in your previous projects you go to places and you keep going back over a period of time or you go to a particular community, like you did a, a project with the swimmers that you just mentioned, and you, you work with those people over a period of time. So that that's those seems to be kind of two consistent themes in your work, like place and, and people. Yeah, place and people. I mean, I, I say on my website that uh, that my work is uh, mainly concerned with the individual in his or her environment, and in my practice, I explore how we are shaped to the environmental situations in which we find ourselves. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, I wrote that a few years ago, mm -hmm. but that still stands. And, yeah. you know, when I start a new project, I always feel like I'm, I'm start, this is different, this is new, but it always seems to come back to that idea mm -hmm. of how we are shaped by our environmental situations, whether that's in a just kind of, um, I don't know, there's a, a lot of positivity in what I do, but you know whether it's uh, kind of recreational, as in swimming in the sea, or it's you know something more fundamental like trying to find a home. Yeah. It's um, it, it is really about the individual and where they live and what they do around where they live. Yeah. And uh, it was the same with the urban farms, a uh, kind of exploring the same idea. Um, yeah, we, we might take the opportunity just to show people who are, or have joined us a bit about your previous projects, you know, to see some of the work you've done before. Yeah. Uh, if you could maybe share the okay. screen and have a look at those. Yeah. Uh, and one, uh, one of the things I suppose that is consistent is this idea also of community, because you're looking at groups of people who have particular relationships like the urban farmers and the swimmers or have yeah. something in common. 
Yeah. Now, um, can you see that? Yeah, so that, that's okay. your current so, so, well, yeah, I just go back to the home page of the, uh, uh, sorry, here we go. Okay, so I'll go back a, a few years. Um, in fact, I'll go back to the NCAD and this was um, a very early project. Um, I did when I was in NCAD, mm -hmm. it was called Liminal spaces, uh, liminal is a word that's used often in photography. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. it's not um, a significant uh, word really, but uh, it does mean a kind of like a transition between two states. And sure. these were kind of people who were uh, changing from, you know, something, some change in their life, like having a baby or, um, in this case, I was all in the moving home. So in each case, there was a kind of a, a story, and this was a, a dancer. So what uh, what I did in this series was to ask the participants to um, perform something in uh, in an environment very close to where they live. Sure. And uh, this was a swimmer, actually. Okay. Um, tai Chi practitioner. Um, uh, a yoga practitioner. And um, so another yoga practitioner, but not in the yoga stance. Um, so that, that's, that was kind of like starting off project, if you like. I moved on to um, the grey and the green, which was looking at the community gardens and uh, urban farms that mm -hmm. uh, were burgeoning around Dublin uh, around 2010, which is when I start 2011, when I started this project. Um, it was it was a very significant um, time, I think, because it was the uh, it was the fallout from the crash, the economic crash, mm -hmm. and the the gardens were significant. Uh, I I thought I started thinking I was looking at allotments, but I uh, found these uh, urban farms, and a lot of the sites were specifically there because. Um, um, because development, housing developments had been stopped and the sites were made available to the local communities for gardens. And that was one of them there, I think, in centre of Dublin. That's another one near Fibsborough. Uh, that's one that's subsequently gone. That was actually, it's near Cork Street. Uh, that's another one uh, near Fatima, the old Fatima mansions. But these are some of these are gone now and they have been developed sure. for housing in recent years. This is one which is still thriving in North Strand simply because the council gave up on building houses there because the access is through a laneway along here, which is uh, too narrow to bring trucks. So the, the community has a thriving garden there. So I, I, I moved on with that project after I left college and I went to Berlin it's, this is Berlin. Um, for different reasons, they had um, significant gardens in Berlin. Um, it was more to do with East Meets West, the, the reunification, that there were sites that nobody knew who owned, and yeah. temporarily uh, communities were allowed to um, develop them for gardens. And they actually stayed as gardens for a lot longer than people imagined. It's the mm -hmm. same garden from a height. Yeah. Um, this is another garden in Berlin. Uh, so that's the same second garden in Berlin. This yeah. is in Leipzig. I went up to Leipzig. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, with uh, through uh, people I got to know in Dublin Community Growers, we went on a trip to Cuba and they, we visited gardens in community gardens because it started, the whole idea had started in, in Cuba. Um, earlier because of um, the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the lack of financial support uh, from uh, Russia, people needed to start growing their own vegetables. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that had become more developed over the years. And this was the previous pictures were in Havana. This is in Trinidad de Cuba. And this is the last one here is Trinidad also. Mm -hmm. Um, then there was <clears throat> a recent project, kind of lighter in tone. It was a, a work that I had 
started uh, when I was in MCID. It was a project that I had abandoned. And it's never nice to abandon a project. <laughs> I'd wanted to uh, go back to it. It was Sea Swimmers and started off at the 40 foot here early in the morning and move on to other um, swimming places like the Vico. Mm -hmm. And um, this, it, it struck me that um, the people you meet at um, these swimming spots, they, uh, they, they said, tended to have a set time. It was like a ritual. It was like going to church or something. Yeah. And uh, in the changing hut here in the Vico, someone had put a cross <laughs> one day. So I photographed that, I thought it was significant. Um, the, um, this is um, an end of White Rock Beach where some people swim without tugs. And that's, uh, in a way, that was partly um, why the first attempt at doing this project was well, a bit of a failure because um, um, I was kind of shy about approaching people and particularly people who might want to be photographed because they were naked and um, the uh, lecturer at the time in NCAD says, oh, just photograph from them from, from behind and there won't be any problem, which I didn't do at the time. But when I went back to it, I did. But I just took that on as an aesthetic more than anything else. And I sure. still asked the people's permission. And in each case, I had a, a chat with them before taking mm -hmm. their photograph, even though uh, I'm photographing them from behind. Yeah, it's, it seems very much with this project and the other one, you're building up relationships with the people that you photograph because you're going back mm. and you're going back over time. Mm. Exactly. Um, this is a woman who used to who used to go for a run and um, at the end of her run, she'd go down to Vico and strip off and have a good long swim. So um, I thought that was kind of a ritual of its own and I met her and uh, she agreed to be photographed. And this was full wall on the north side. So uh, this was scary. So I, I, I ventured, that was the furthest I ventured. Uh, Scaries is a long way out. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that one. And uh, then the recent home place. So the current one, yeah. Yeah, the current one. Um, so we've been talking about this uh, throughout, but in, in depth, um, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, this, um, this particular image here. I suppose uh, was a significant one for me. It was, I wasn't that long into the project um, when I came across this house in, near Monaghan town. And it was kind of, I had kind of uh, gone past the point where every time I saw an empty house, I would stop and photograph it. Mm -hmm. I realized A, there was some of them that I didn't need to do that. And B, uh, some were more interesting than others. Yeah. And this one was really caught my interest. Um, mainly, I think the, the wooden picket fence, uh, it kind of like, it kind of tells a story about domesticity. And then the fact that the, the windows had been boarded up, but obviously boarded up quite some time ago and painted green, but the green paint itself had faded. So it was like a um, fairly modern house, which had been abandoned, boarded up, and then left for a long time and was covered in green ivy and green paint mm -hmm. and um, spent some time photographing that one. Yeah. Um, so at some stage, then I moved on to photographing people. And the first uh, people I photographed were this father and daughter living in a bus. And uh, it was <clears throat> um, fairly basic their accommodation they had um he had actually owned a site and uh, had tried to build a house but was refused planning permission so he was quite enterprising and was able to turn this old bus into a space to live in for, on a temporary basis um and some of these pictures again like to say it, i took the most interesting of the uh empty houses and this was in County Mead. I was on the way back from a, a journey. This was um, uh, a local uh, woman that we knew uh, who lived in a small cottage and had chosen for various reasons to stay in a tiny old cottage rather than knock it down and build a new one. Um, some of the pictures of the houses were taken 
around, uh, sorry, go back to that, the Tyrone Guthrie Centre in County Monaghan, because okay. I was based there for a week and uh, really launched the project there in terms of finding empty houses. Yeah, one of the things I was curious about mm. was how you chose the locations that you did. I mean, how, how did you go about finding these places? You know? Yeah, I um, uh, just, yeah, well, sorry, we're just out of those. Um, I, um, well, just to go back a bit, I, I, I can uh, leave this for the moment, I'll stop sharing. Um, I, just to go back a bit, I was um, interested in the idea of empty houses and the phenomenon of uh, abandoned houses and what that said about the house and the people who used to live there long before it was such um, a blight in the landscape. And it was right back to the Tom Waits song, uh, The House Where Nobody Lives, okay. which gave me an idea of a photographic idea actually a long time ago that song came out in 1999 but I always I, I, I remember saying to someone that would make a um, a great book of photographs you know finding empty houses and um, telling their stories and uh, I began to notice them uh, off and on but obviously there was they became more plentiful and I was on a trip down to West Cork in late 2018 and I uh, I, I passed two or three of them and I said, really, I should just, I had a camera with me. I was going on a vacation. So I, I said, I really should stop and photograph some of these houses. Mm -hmm. And I started there on, in West Cork, uh, photographing two or three houses on the way. And then when I got the residency subsequently in the Tyrone Guthrie Center, it was just where the art center there, which is a fantastic retreat center for artists. Um, I was staying there for a week and based, you know, based myself there, driving around, looking for a, empty houses. It just happened to be in a part of Ireland that probably has more empty houses than anywhere else. It's Monaghan, Cavan, uh, Leitrim, that area. Yeah. And I drove around there and photographed lots of houses, um, showed them to some people, other residents, there were writers and other visual artists there. We shared our work at the end of the week and mm -hmm. uh, compared notes and um, that got me going. And um, it was kind of, I had so many photographs built up that it became a kind of uh, a typography, if you like, that um, there was um, similarities at the look of all these houses yeah. and my approach to photographing them. Uh, yeah, might might be interesting for people to to hear a bit about your your photographic influences and how those those have shaped the the project. I mean, not just this project, but all your all your work. But yeah, I think they're particularly visible with this project as well. Yeah, I suppose um, for each for each project, I would um, I this is something I learned more in NCAD than in Ulster University as an approach, but the approach is to kind of, it's always with photography, um, you know, you have to kind of accept that it's always been done before, <laughs> you know, that whatever you're, you're photographing, someone else has always photographed it. And maybe your approach is slightly different, but the best approach I find is to research um, other photographers who have done this type of work and um, not to copy them, but to absorb how they've approached it and, see things about their work that would um, that would uh, be of interest and influence perhaps how I might approach the work. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, so Maura, if you would um, share the files that I uh, sent you, if that's possible. Yeah, we have we have some uh, influences to look at here. Just in yeah. terms of Jerry's work, I think it would be useful for everybody to see. Yeah, we can look at a slideshow of uh, some work here. Now, this is just uh, some samples of um, um, work that I kind of researched before starting the project or during mm -hmm. it. And this is a Walker Evans picture of a. Um, a house. Uh, Walker, Walker Evans uh, was uh, a 1930s um, American photographer who uh, uh, 
adopted a kind of a plain style approach of um, recording nothing flashy. If you go ahead there, Maura, um, this kind of straight on look at houses or buildings or whatever he was photographing, his aesthetic was to always photograph them straight on. And um, this one here um, is a more recent one. Um, it's a book of photographs that I discovered by Todd Heido, who photographed houses at night in America. And what interested me about Heido was, if you want to just pause it there, Maura, um, was he didn't, he kind of abandoned that straight ahead look that photographers had been doing for years since Walker Evans. And he said he preferred the diagonal uh, effect. Yeah. And that sort of, because you know, I ran into a problem where with narrow streets in rural Ireland or even <laughs> urban Ireland, it's very hard to uh, always get back far enough to photograph how it's straight on. I, I kind of had to change my approach. Yeah. And reading Todd Heido's approach, it kind of um, led me into a way of photographing that was equally as interesting. And they're, they're sort of more emotional pictures as well, aren't they, Jerry? They, they are emotional, yeah. Them. Yeah, he called this uh, series House Hunting, which okay, yeah. was interesting. House Hunting in a different sort of way. He went around different at night with a tripod. Yeah. And um, these are obviously not abandoned houses. They're very much lived in. It's the yeah. light on in the window upstairs that kind of tells the story. Yeah. Um, so go ahead, Maura. Um, uh, this, oh yeah, not quite, not quite in the sequence I thought. This is um, uh, Francis Benjamin Johnson, who I uh, discovered much later on in the project. A phenomenal mm -hmm. uh, woman who in her seventies uh, took on this massive project for the uh, historic, um, what was it called? Uh, the, 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 oh, uh, the Library of Congress, the Historic American Building Survey. And she started this in, in I think, early 70s and did it for years. And uh, go ahead, Maura. The, she just recorded in the south of America old buildings, uh, whether they were abandoned or ruined or still occupied, but that were of interest to architectural historians. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a guy called Jeffrey Ladd who investigated this, this vast library of, um, of photo photographs of American houses. And he collected a subset of the photographs, there's thousands and thousands of them. And I just hold that one there for more uh, into a book he called A Field Measure Survey of American Architecture. Mm -hmm. um, I see we've moved on. So this was a recent, um, and this one, this actually, this, this is uh, 100 Abandoned Houses. Um, it's is a project by a photographer called Kevin Bowman. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can go ahead, Maura. Um, he photographed houses abandoned in Detroit and very much face on with the wide streets of Detroit. But there were practically so many abandoned houses there's probably more abandoned houses than there were houses lived in that detroit had been decimated by the collapse of the motor industry mm -hmm. and he did this fantastic project which the the, the title is a, a little bit of humor it's called 100 abandoned houses simply because he said 100 sounds like a big number there was a lot more than 100 and he even, even sure, took a yeah. lot more than 100 photographs <laughs> yeah, i'm sure yeah uh, so that kind of, when I saw that project, I thought, gosh, yeah, I really want to photograph all these empty houses I'm seeing around yeah. Ireland. Um, and, and, yeah, um, so uh, this is a kind of an example of uh, how I kind of picked up through social media. Okay, um, yeah. This is face, a Facebook group called Derelict uh, Houses or something in Ireland. It's a bit contentious because some people we're actually defending the rights of people to uh, to uh, keep houses derelict, but there were some interesting photographs, and I note them and then um, and, and then follow, follow up on the sites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So when it came to the people, um, uh, there was other photographers. This was a very strange photographer called Chauncey Hare, who's not that famous. He died a couple of years ago, but he did this. Uh, 
a well-known project called Interior America, where he yeah. wanted to fo photograph people in their homes, particularly in their kitchens, and then surreptitiously used a wide angle lens and was actually trying to say more about the houses than about the people, actually tricked them into thinking they were getting a kind of a close-up portrait shot, but the pictures would be more like this, where the subject is relegated to part of the, the corner of the picture. Go ahead, Maura, um, if you want to, the next one, Maura. Are we stuck? <laughs> Oh, oh, yeah, well, there we go. Uh, that's it. Um, this one, I actually photographed, I um, didn't make it to the to the wall in, in the lexicon, but I, I photographed a man sitting right like that on a stool beside a big range down in County Carlo. And I really liked the picture, but it didn't kind of fit with the project. Um, this is another one of Chauncey Harris that he's really photographing the kitchen and the subject is kind of stuck away. Yeah. Um, but go ahead, Mara. Uh, no, the other way. Yeah. Uh, Alex Soth is a particular favorite of mine. He did his road trips, and this one was called Sleeping by the Mississippi, where he photographed the landscape, the houses, the people living in the houses, mm -hmm. their eccentricities, things about them. Uh, it's always been an influence. And this was during the course of the project, uh, a friend just sent me a link to a New Yorker article about a photographer called. Dana Singer, who I hadn't heard of, but I've become a huge fan of since. And she photographed recently, this is actually during the pandemic. She kind of, I'm not sure about the rules in America, but it was kind of during a period of lockdown and she got into a car and she drove around, stayed in motels and photographed people living in motels. Yeah, Quite a simple idea, but very emotional, very effective. These are people who are, you know, don't have much going for them and they kind of kind of homeless in a way they live in motels yeah. and this was um doug dubois who was an influence he came to talk to us when i was in college mm -hmm. uh, he's an american photographer who came to ireland one time to do a, a project based in the serious out of the serious arts center in cove so he went to this um housing estate I met these um, teenagers who we hung out with for a while, even though he was he was about 50 at the time. Uh, didn't know what really what, what he was doing with, well, well, that might be sort of to sell him short. He, he was making good work, but he, the team, I think, emerged uh, as, as he photographed. Sure. And there's one more photograph from him there. Yeah, this one. Um, and it was an example of not always having to know exactly what the project is about when you uh, start to take the pictures. Um, it can emerge, you know, and the stories kind of tell themselves. That might be the last. Oh, yeah, sorry. This is Jeff Wall. And I just included that. Um, he's a different kind of photographer. He makes these staged pictures. But this one was called Tattoos and Shadows. And I used that kind of effect of the shadows from the trees in one of the pictures, the first picture of Owen, who's in the exhibition. Sure. Um, it was a sunny evening, a bit too sunny to get a good straight ahead portrait. So I used the shadows. Mm -hmm. um, not sure what else we got here. Yeah, Katie Grannon, who's a really excellent portrait photographer. This was the portrait she did of Robert Frank for the, um, for the New York Times magazine. Robert Frank was a um, famous American photographer and she did this shortly before he died. She's still going strong. Mm -hmm. And the last one is from Katie Grannon's own work uh, called Model America, mm -hmm. really good book. So I, I think that's kind of it. Yeah, on the, the one, so yeah. Maybe you, you talk a bit about the importance of portraiture in your own project, because yeah. I, I think that's a, 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 an interesting Subject yeah, yeah, no, I love talking about other people's work. But, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I, I had done um, a lot of work of photographing the houses. And in the back of my mind, there was two things going on. One was that the project needed a bit of something else. Mm -hmm. And the other thought I had was that I really want to go back to doing portraits because I like photographing people. I like yeah. 
photographs with people in them, I find them more interesting. So uh, when someone suggested, someone else said to me, I think it needs something else. I said, yeah, OK, I'm going to do portraits. And then, like, who am I going to photograph? Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely wasn't going to photograph, air quotes, the homeless, because I, I, I don't like the phrase anyway. And I didn't want to be telling hard luck stories. I really, from the outset, wanted people's own stories to emerge. But obviously, I started by looking for people that had interesting housing situations. Yeah. That's the way I put it. And the first one I met or contacted was uh, David, who was living in the bus. Okay. And that, that started the ball rolling. He's um, someone I knew anyway. I could talk to, could go and spend a day with him mm -hmm. and take some pictures. Uh, from there, uh, it was tended to be contacts. You know, yeah. one would lead to another. David knew one or two other people living uh, in interesting places. And as it went on, though, I was photographing people who are interesting as much as people's housing situations being interesting. And in some cases, I would go to the house thinking, well, they've just bought a new house. You know, this is not going to be very good for the project, but let's see what they have to say. And sometimes there would be a st an interesting story. In one case, a marriage breakup shortly after they bought the house. Um, and some case, you know, you would go to a person or a couple and thinking, oh, yes, this is going to be very interesting. And it's not quite as interesting. They have a nice place. The rent's not too much. <laughs> you don't really have a great story. And you take the pictures and, you know, have to decide afterwards whether they contribute to the project mm -hmm. yeah. or not. And then there were some surprises. Uh, one was Kamla, who... I was staying in her bed and breakfast when I was in Cork to photograph other people and other houses. And I was fascinated with her house and I was fascinated with her story. So, and she wanted to be in the project. So I photographed her and she kind of made it through to the, to to, the, to the final edit, exhibition. Yeah. yeah, to the edit, yeah. Um, and then in terms of putting the exhibition together, Jerry, how, yeah. how important was it to you to include some of the people's stories in the installation? Because for those of you who haven't seen it, there are small quotations or, or snippets of the people's stories themselves alongside the portraits. So how important was it for, for you to put that in there or, or was it not? It, it was important, but it seemed to happen organically. And I can't remember really the moment that I decided, yeah, I'm going to do that. It, it didn't okay. seem to be a big decision um i know i've subsequently seen other work where people have done it there was um Brittany powell did a project called the debt project in america about student debt yeah. and she had testimonies from each of the people but i think i had already started collecting people's stories before i saw that work um I think it was partly um, a reaction to um, the Sea Swimmers project. I kind of pared back the information to almost zero. I didn't even put the name of the location. Yeah. <laughs> and afterwards I thought maybe that was taking it a bit too far. Maybe people need some insight, you know, just kind of a lead in uh, to, to what it's about. Um, and I kind of wanted to just be more open, be it just to be a more open kind of project with more information. And um, the, the stories were interesting. I wanted it to be in people's own words. Um, uh, I'm not sure. I think the first one or two interesting stories, I wrote them down. Some people had, you know, funny stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And, but in each case, I went back to them with what I had, what I had noted about what we just, what we talked about, what they'd said to me. Sure. And sometimes they, you know, they wanted to make changes. They didn't want to make certain things public, or they wanted to okay. make a different emphasis. Um, yeah, I can't really say I, it was a definitive part of the project, but it kind of organically, kind of developed along with the. The portraits uh, and it made sense yeah it made sense yeah. and i just went along 
kept mm -hmm. with it. There was just one case where uh, one of the uh, sitters, um, I contacted him, uh, had written down what he'd said, and he said, no, I don't want any of that, and I don't want you to use my name, nothing. So mm -hmm. eventually he agreed to let me use his first name, and that was it. But mm -hmm. that's the only one. Uh, uh, the others were happy enough to uh, share their stories, yeah. And, and is there a, a portrait or a, a site or a house even that you think is like particularly representative of the project? Is there something that you think, okay, that, that sums it up? Yeah, well, the the, the County Monaghan, the Monaghan town picture that we talked about, I talked with, with the picket fence, yeah. with the picket fence, that's definitely one. And um, that kind of, it, that became kind of definitive, I mean, quite a ways into the edit I didn't even I hadn't even picked which I had photographed that house from an angle a la Tardo mm -hmm. as well and we couldn't even decide which picture to use and it's funny as it happens that when you do make a decision usually the other pictures just fall away yeah. and that kind of and and then we made the decision to um there was um Siobhan Mooney curator was was working with me on the edit and some friends Diane White and Frank Little uh, were, um, we were, you know, um, you know, I, my, my original idea was to make a feature um, of the end wall in the gallery with the grill, the grid uh, for people who have seen the um, exhibition or haven't seen the exhibition. There's a grid of photographs at, at the end wall. And I've noticed in previous exhibitions there when you walk in that mm -hmm. it's the end wall you see immediately. But uh, in kind of change of mind, then I wanted to feature that particular image. So we put in a temporary wall okay. uh, partway down the gallery. So the first image you see is that one. Um, if you were, um, I think you were asking me earlier today, Darren, about. Um, Particular portrait, and I hadn't thought of being a, there being a particular portrait. I suppose um, perhaps the the portrait of Owen, the the, the other Owen from Sligo, uh, mm -hmm. might be a good one to kind of sum up the the portraits because he's someone with an interesting story about how he yeah. moved from Dublin to Sligo, but also in that he's the only one who's actually doing up an abandoned. He bought an abandoned house. Yeah, got permission. I didn't know this, but if if a if a if a house has been declared derelict, you need planning permission to do it up. Okay. And um, he got plan permission, and he particularly wants a, a traditional type of old Irish cottage called a three room cottage, mm -hmm. and he's doing that up, and he's planning to live there. So that's a significant one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. The other thing I was curious about is whether or not your sense of like what home means to people has changed over the course of, of working on the project. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I've got to know uh, a lot of the sitters and what home means to them. And it's, you know, it's a nice, uh, it's nice uh, to be invited into their homes and to get a feeling for what it means. But you know, I, on the other hand, I do get a bit despondent. I, I, I kind of, you know, on the one hand, I didn't want to be photographing people who are living alternatively. It's not about that. I don't see them as that. They're trying to make the best of situation that they were in, they were in whether it's a difficult situation or not. And, you know, we all have difficulties and a lot of people are in difficult situations because of the housing crisis. Yeah. And it is a crisis. But, you know, in other ways, I got more despondent as I went on. I didn't see things improving. Mm -hmm. I still haven't really. I mean, I think, still think housing is seen as a, as a commodity, as an increasing asset. Yeah. And I don't like terms like, you know, housing ladder, which I don't even think there's such a thing as a housing ladder. Mm -hmm. That, you, you know, that is, it assumes you, when you buy your first house, you think about buying the second one. Yeah. And which is another story because... It can be as difficult to buy the second house, a bigger house, after buying the first one. And there's no step back on the housing ladder if if your first purchase doesn't work out. Yeah. Situations like marriage breakdowns or you know, people losing jobs. 
Um, so it's this kind of some of these terms are insulting and meaningless. The other thing that came up a lot was planning. Yeah. And um, planning in Ireland, I, I tend to disagree with a lot of people's takes on planning, you know, not just the corruption and planning that we've had over the years, but people who want to see an excess or an abundance of democracy in every decision. I think it's time to really loosen the planning laws when it comes to home homing people. Mm -hmm. And and the only the only really upside I see is in the in the discourse around the the refugees from Ukraine because suddenly there's a human uh, and it's a great thing that's now kind of a more humane discourse in sure. that we talk about people having to be homed and mm -hmm. having to make new rules you know for example recently they said they would allow um uh, people on on state benefits to rent out rooms in their homes mm -hmm. which previously was not allowed and that's great and any of these new rules can't be restricted to the refugees only. They have to be uh, open to, to all comers. So I think through this um, other emergency being the war, uh, I think we may see some changes and that's my only optimism really, yeah. And what, what's next for you as a photographer, Joey? I know you've just kind of finished one big body mm -hmm. of work, but uh... You know where where do you think you'll go with it? Will you continue with this project, or is yeah, it going to new? Yeah, it's it's. I mean, uh, yeah, photographers are terrible, really, for always kind of stopping and then jumping to the next project. And yeah. you know, painters tend to continue with what they're doing. Yeah, and it would be nice to continue, and I will, and I have. I have uh, some more contacts of mostly people rather than houses that I do mm. want to photograph, but I have other ideas uh, for future projects um, like this. I think we have a, a kind of a pandemic of loneliness mm. uh, upon us uh, in the Western world and this country as much as anywhere else. I'm not sure how you photograph that, mm. uh, but that's on my mind. Um, I don't. I for the future, yeah. Yeah, well, for we, the future. We look, yeah. We, look, we look forward to see how you, you solve that problem. Yeah, yeah. we'll solve that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. We're, we're coming up to, to 10 to 8 now. So we might, um, Maura, if you want to just stop our spotlight, we can maybe turn it over to some questions if anybody wants to turn off their camera and, and uh, have, have a, a word with us about, about the project with Jerry. You know, a bit of discussion is always welcome. We'd be happy to hear from you. Uh, I should say as well, um, Maura in the Arts Office has put Jerry's website address and the website uh, details for the opening hours in the Municipal Gallery. If anybody wants to check out the exhibition there, the information is in the chat so you can get it there. Um, yeah. And you can also, yeah, you can also use the chat to ask questions. If you yeah, can. if everybody wants to type in Yeah, a, a you can question. put the, the questions directly into the chat. You don't need to turn your camera on or anything like that if you, if you don't feel like that. Uh, and as I said at the start as well, the, we recorded our session. So if anybody wants to watch it back, it will be available uh, online in the future from, from the Arts Office. I'll just um, continue talking for a bit while we're waiting on questions. Yeah, I was just well, yeah. going to say, um, about the pandemic of loneliness, I do tend to focus. Uh, I don't know why, but I do, I do tend to focus on the on the optimistic in my sure. project. So the other side of that coin was um, a kind of interest I've had recently in um, how people do get together community wise. And sure, I've never yeah. I've never been a, a sports person, but uh, weekend sports is um, something that I think is might be right for a, a project, you know, people meeting on yeah. weekends and getting involved in various activities. Well, um, it, goes, it goes back mm. to that thing of community that you always seem to circle around community and place. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. Well, I, suppose um, the, I suppose the the, the different housing situations, they're, they're also a, like a community of people. They don't know each other necessarily, but they're-, they're Yeah, well, 
sometimes they do we know each other i mean yeah. there, there's, <laughs> and, and a, another funny thing is that uh, there was a couple of people in my in, in my community gardens project that ended up in the into the sea project because they okay. were sea swimmers and they could have ended up in the okay, um, yeah. current project they live in a really interesting house uh, and I, I just thought that, you know, I can't have them in every project. <laughs> well, it might be interesting to have yeah, yeah. continuity. Can continuity, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hold so. on. Paul, have you got a question? Oh, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I was just looking to, looking to light up, Jerry. I suppose, um, hold on, I'll stick on my video. Uh, my question would be, how do you... Um, where do you get your ideas from in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the projects you're coming up with? Yeah, the, the, it's a good question, Paul, because I, every time I, I start a new project, I realise that it's an idea I've had for years. It's funny, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of lurking in the back of my head. And it's only when I get going on it, I realise, God, I've been thinking of this for years. Like Into the Sea, as I said, uh, was one that I'd started in NCAD around... 2009 and uh, kind of got nowhere with it. I wanted to go back to it. That was straightforward. The current project, um, uh, as I say, was the, was the Tom Waits song years ago. But I remember also seeing this woman on the Late Late Show who had uh, um, brought out a book. She, she, was, she had retired from her job and did a course in photography and then uh, a did a photograph of ruined buildings uh, around Ireland. And I wasn't very interested in our book. It's a bit of a cliche in photography, these kind of old ruins. But I thought, yeah, that'd be great to do something like that, um, uh, just on abandoned houses. And that was years ago. So it was, must have been lurking in the back of my mind. Uh, and then the, the grey and the green, the community gardens, mm -hmm. I did have an idea of doing a project on... Um, uh, allotments and was kind of discouraged in college from doing that because a lot of people had done allotments but then I came across community gardens so you know you can start um, you can start on one thing and it leads to something else that's another way of doing it um, I heard a quotation from uh, Paul Simon the singer recently where he said he, he told he was talking to this visual artist whose name I've forgotten and he was telling him that he wasn't going to um, do any new work. And he said, because he didn't have any new ideas. And the visual artist said to him, well, that doesn't make sense. He says, you get your ideas by doing it, you know. So you go out and take pictures. And, you know, you see uh, two or three that kind of click together. And you think, well, that could be the start of something, you know. So you, you can get your ideas as well by just doing the work, you know, or following your own interests. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, uh, oh, hold on. Jerry. Frank, is it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we're in the Anne Doherty guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, uh, the, what I was going to say, uh, how long was it, how long was it before uh, when you knew that the lexicon was, uh, were, was going to give you the exhibition and was it, the, the full COVID uh, two years that you had this deadline. Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, I was pure lucky there. I, um, well, you know, at first, I suppose it was um, a combination of, of luck and um, uh, industry in the first place that I applied back in the end of 2019 was an open submission. Oh. Yeah. And I, in February, they sent me a notification that there was two winners and I was one of them. And that was great. And the first was supposed to be an exhibition that the other person had won was an exhibition in 2021 and mine was to be 2022. So it, it was lucky. I kind of leapfrogged COVID. You know, it was uh, very lucky. I had two years to finish the project uh, regardless uh, mm. because it wasn't scheduled till 2022 anyway. And I think the person who had actually been scheduled for 2021 was cancelled and was actually put back later. It hasn't, hasn't ha happened yet. So I was very lucky. And uh, yeah. 
And you, yeah. you also had the uh, something to think about during COVID. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I was itching to get back, particularly to the pro, to the uh, the portraits. And uh, there was difficult times where, you know, even when they lifted the kind of 5K restrictions and things like that, it was still not kosher to go into people's houses or to ask them, can you do your portrait? You had to kind of wait till till better times, you know? So yeah, it, it, it there, there was long periods where I couldn't do any portraits, never mind. But you certainly had plenty of time to think about the project. Plenty of time to think about it and research and that. Yeah, indeed. Right. So Congratulations, we brilliant, brilliant show and brilliant talk. Thanks, thanks, Frank. Thanks so we just have a couple of questions here in the in the chat, Jerry. So I'll read them out yeah. to you. So from Dara Carrigan, hi Dara. Uh, hi Jerry, was there a particular abandoned building or buildings that you felt compelled to research further, i.e., previous owners? Um the, the well, I was gonna say there wasn't, but there kind of was. There was one in Wicklow Town. Uh, for those who have seen the um, exhibition, it's on the back of the temporary wall where that green building is. It's kind of a, a pink building with white boards boarded up. And it's a very elaborate, again, a kind of a very kind of American looking building with a balcony on the first floor. And I, I don't live that far in from Wicklow town. I am... Uh, so I, I, I went, I drove down there a few times at different times a day to photograph it. Yeah. And one time I was there and literally a, a drunk walked by, mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a, you know, a kind of a sad case, I suppose. He wasn't that, he was youngish, yeah. very drunk about six o'clock in the evening. And he said, are you, he saw me with the camera. He said, interested in buying that house. And I said, no, I'm just interested in photographing of it. I, it yeah. I said, can you tell me anything about it? And he said, oh, there was a family lived there and they had four children. But two of the children died and they mm -hmm. left one day and they never came back. Now, that's probably pretty apocryphal, maybe something to the story. Yeah. Um, I didn't really know to need to know the full story, but it just was kind of haunting enough, even though he was drunk and he might have got the facts all wrong. Yeah, it could have been a family could have had a child, could have had a tragedy, and maybe they did leave. He said they went to America. Sure. And yeah. it's as kind of enough as, um, as much as I needed to know, really. I mm -hmm. didn't really know, need to know the actual story. Yes, yeah. So another question here from Lisa, do you find that you're more comfortable photographing your own community or ones you aren't as familiar with? Uh, I think I'm more, well, it's kind of a halfway house there, I think, Lisa. Um, I, I'm i comfortable. I, I haven't been, you know, haven't managed to do projects that some people do about their own families or sure. their own gardens, as some people have done very successfully, or just the, the immediate, you know, in 2K lockdown, there was an opportunity to do something <laughs> really close to home, but yeah. you no. Know, it's not, I don't feel comfortable with it at all. Same time, I do tend to work with people that I've kind of made a connection with rather than complete strangers. Yeah. And a question then from S. Maline. Hi, Jerry, you have collaborated with, in the past with other artists, particularly writers. Uh, how does this collaboration enhance your photographic practice? And do you have plans to collaborate with other types of artists in the future? Uh, yeah, well, uh, that uh, summer, hi, summer. Uh, the yeah that's hit and miss i mean it collaborations are great when they work and it's really um nice to meet someone that you click with and recently mm -hmm. i did uh, i walked through another event during this exhibition yeah. with jessica trainer who's a poet and is the writer in residence currently for john leary and um i really got on well with her and she actually wrote a poem to in, in response to her seeing the, 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 the work. And she read the poem in, in, um, in the event, in, in the walkthrough. Yeah. So, but there, there are times, like, to be honest, I did try to work with a short story writer uh, that didn't work out. Um, I did collaborate with another short story writer who had a, a completed work that I liked that was fairly straightforward. 
Yeah. And I did try to work with a visual artist who's still a friend, but like just artistically, we didn't gel. So okay. it's it's difficult, and I would like to. I'm open to doing it in the future. With and, uh, I like working with writers, so you know, if I was working on a book, I'd like to work with a writer. With a writer, sure. Yeah. Now, finally, I see uh, Jonathan has raised his hand, so maybe he wants to ask a question or or has something to say. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, can you hear you. How are you doing? Oh, perfect. Cool. Thanks. Um, first of all, Jerry, I just wanted to say it was really interesting hearing you talk about your work. Um, I'm really grateful I joined because your work resonates a lot with the topics that I'm really interested in as well. So it's amazing to hear another photographer speak about, uh, you know, home, location, environment and so on. But, yeah. Uh, my question then is about just about relationship to Ireland and your work. So it was really interesting to hear about your projects like community gardens where yeah. it stemmed from Dublin, but you kind of explored that then in a global context in Germany, Cuba and other places you said. But mm. Your more recent work as well. Do you think subconsciously or kind of like a sub theme uh was that also related to a sense of home specifically related to ireland or is it something that could also be translated in global context for example or was that not something you were considering at all when well, making the work yeah a good question uh jonathan thanks um i it wasn't something i considered this time i did think of it and i still kind of do as an irish question uh, and I'm, I'm resistant to the idea of, of seeing it in global terms, quite simply because I've heard too many politicians uh, use that almost as an excuse that um, interest rates are low and while interest rates are low, house prices will be high and it's a global phenomenon. And uh, I know that's not the artistic approach and the artistic approach might be to go to another country which is experiencing the same kind of problems and um, maybe uh, make work there. And you could, you know, there, there, there are cities like uh, San Francisco that I know is, is kind of been devastated by uh, runaway house prices and runaway rents. Um, to be honest, I haven't considered it yet, but I wouldn't rule it out. Sometimes these things just evolve. Um, conversely, I was in Sweden recently and I photographed because I had brought my camera and I love Swedish houses. I, sw I photographed a lot of houses there. I didn't see a single empty house. So it's a different story. Um, uh, if I was to uh, continue to explore, um, you know, my interest in Swedish houses, it would be a different project. Uh, but I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't know. Did you, were you thinking of particular places, Jonathan, that you know about that are experiencing kind of similar difficulties housing wise, or was it just a general question? Uh, it was a general question. Funnily yeah. enough, it was only yeah. actually since you mentioned Berlin with your community gardens project, yeah. it kind of sparked me that that Berlin is also having a um, housing crisis of its own. Yeah. Um, not that it would be similar to the one in Dublin or similar in different ways but yeah. yeah so I kind yeah. of thought perhaps you were also thinking of you know drawing connections there with different countries and similar situations or if that was just like, yeah way further down the line or the back of your head yeah it's further down the line but I kind of looking in this project at the Irish situation it's I suppose is the short answer yeah well I, I, I think I think thank you, thank you for your question, John. I think we'll we'll leave it there. Thank you, Jerry, for a really interesting conversation. Uh, thanks to everyone at the Arts Office, to DLR Arts Office, uh, Maura, uh, Maura and and uh, Maura for our tech assistance this evening. Uh, the exhibition continues until June third at uh, the Municipal Gallery in the Lexicon. So I really do encourage you to to visit it or to revisit it if you haven't seen it already. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming, and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a million, Darren. Thank and, you, Darren. Uh, yeah. I enjoyed thanks, that. Darren. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sorry for any other questions that we didn't get to.